Social Care Services Subcommittee meeting dated the 17th of February 2023 at uh, 11.30 a.m. By, via Webex. Um, I'll move on to the agenda. Um, we have uh, apologies from Councillor Swift. Um, do we have any other apologies? Apology from Councillor Fitzgerald, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Maguire. Um, so, uh, as Chair, I am going... Yes, sorry. Sorry, John, can I just um, offer Neil's apologies, Neil Gokin's apologies as well? Please. Okay, thank you. They'll be recorded for the uh, agenda. Um, so, we, uh, as Chair, I'm going to bring item five up uh, to the top of the agenda and then item seven. Um, so that's item five is to receive an update on services in Southwest Acute Hospital, including obstetrics and gynecology and diagnostic radiology and uh, a presentation to receive uh, CAMS update and an industrial action update. Um, I'll probably have to declare an interest, do I, in um, industrial action? Uh, Chair, it's always up to the individual member, but I think it would be prudent. But I imagine you, you you wouldn't be contributing to the discussion, but you just facilitate other members' input. Okay, I will. Uh, that's okay. I will chair the uh, discussion, but will take no actor part uh, in the, the active discussion. Uh, so, um, I'd like to welcome. Um, we have from the trust, we have Mark Gillespie, uh, Interim Director uh, of Acute Services, Karen uh, Hargan, Donna Keenan, Brendan Lavery, uh, Dr. Lisa Brady, Mr. Kevin Duffy, and Oliver Kelly, Head of Communications. So uh, you are welcome. So I'll pass over and uh, start the uh, update on services in SWA, please. Okay. Um, thank you, John. There, there's probably a couple of other bits that we want to just um, bring you up to speed as well, too. One of the aspects is on um, the golden hour as part of that update, and there's a, a significant piece about investment in SWA as well, too, which we'd just like to bring you um, up, up to date with, if that's okay, as part of this update. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, okay. So, um, so update on services in Southwest Acute Hospital, including obstetrics and gynaecology and diagnostic radiology. Um, the Western Trust and the Department of Health um, are fully committed to the sustainability and future of obstetrics and gynaecology services, including all maternity services at Southwest Acute Hospital in Enniskillen. Southwest Acute Hospital is funded for six whole-time equivalent consultant obstetricians. Six consultants are currently on the rota, and the rota remains stable. This currently includes locum consultant cover due to sickness and absence, and cover for a consultant who left to take up a post elsewhere. This would be part of standard process for any service that we would be running. Recruitment has been ongoing, and this includes recruitment for two substantive consultant posts, in addition to specialty doctors in obstetrics and gynaecology. The two consultant posts were last advertised with a closing date of the 13th of January 23, um, in which there were no applicants. And this has now been re-advertised. This now includes advertising in inter international medical journals, through international medical recruitment, um, interviews are scheduled for obstetrics and gynaecology in Southwest Acute at the end of February 2023. So there are interviews planned. In addition to these normal recruitment processes and procedures, the the, including the International Recruitment for International Medical Recruitment Program, the Trust is also promoting this via our social media channels as part of our overall campaign. It is also important to provide some context again that the health service as a whole throughout the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland continues to experience ongoing challenges and pressures, which has been seen in all acute hospitals in Northern Ireland. As a smaller rural hospital, Southwest Acute has been and will continue to face workforce challenges. As stated, there is no ongoing recruitment process. Uh, there is an ongoing recruitment process in place for obstetrics and gynaecology in addition to other services and the Western Trust will continue to focus on highlighting a very positive message regarding our wonderful staff and our state-of-the-art facilities. Pre-COVID, um, we have featured our healthcare heroes in the West, 
with our Western Trust Heroes campaign, and this now resumes and will again be given special attention at our Western Trust um, Awards on the 9th of March. However, we must point out that it has also been emphasised in recent months that um, there are very obvious negative public narrative, and regardless of whether of where it is emanating from, it is impacting on our fantastic hospital. The Trust are therefore asking our partners in public to work with us in helping to promote SWA as a great place to work and a great place to live. In respect of the points raised in relation to diagnostic radiology, two posts were advertised in November 2022 with a closing date of the 23rd of December, which there were no applicants for. This again is also being re-advertised and the Trust has appointed two radiology consultants through international recruitment. One commences contract at the end of March 2023, with the second appointment commencing at the end of June 2023. Another radiologist has also been appointed on the 14th of February 2023. So there are ongoing recruitment um, strategies within the Trust um, to um, fill some of the vacancies, both in radiology and indeed in obstetrics and gynaecology as well. Um, Responses from the department in respect of um, in respect of health and respect of the emergency department being a type one and having a type one status, um, the definitions in the list of all EDs in Northern Ireland is available in Annex Two of the Department of Health published emergency waiting time statistics, and very clearly they state that a type one emergency department is consultant led with designated accommodation for the reception of emergency care patients providing both emergency medicine and emergency sur surgical services. 24 hours a day, um, and from that definition, um, it is clear that Southwest Acute remains um, a Type One um, emergency department, um, and we have clarification in writing from um, from the department um, supporting that that is actually the case. Um, type Two department is also listed there in terms of a consultant-led service with designated accommodation for the reception of emergency care patients, but which does not provide both emergency medicine and emergency surgical services and or has time limited opening hours so our service remains 24 7 across seven days of the week type 3 emergency department then is a minor injury unit with designated accommodation for the reception of patients with minor injury and minor illness it may be a doctor or nurse led a defining characteristic of this service is that it treats at least minor injuries and or illnesses and can routinely be accessed without an appointment removal of general surgery from southwest acute does not change its status from a type one emergency department. Um, I had suggested as well too that there was an additional piece that we wanted to bring you through as well too, which is um, going to be taken through by Brendan, um, Brendan Laffrey in terms of the golden hour. Yeah. So this is in direct response to a question that was asked. So the term golden hour was first used by Dr. Crowley. This was a surgeon in Baltimore, USA in 1975 in respect to trauma care. He stated that the first day after injury will largely determine a critically injured person's chance of survival. This was in the context of no organized trauma care, 1970s standard medicine, and no effective pre-hospital care, as was typical of that time. It's reasonable to state this concept is outdated and is effectively a historical opinion that has become embedded in the public consciousness. There have been multiple studies carried out across the world which have failed to find any significant survival advantage for trauma patients with shorter pre-hospital rescue times. Trauma care has changed beyond recognition in the past decade, initially across England, Scotland and Wales, and more recently within the last five years across Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Patients are now preferentially taken, where possible, to the most appropriate hospital first for trauma care. And of note, across GB, no patient with major trauma would be taken to hospital which did not have trauma and orthopaedic surgeons on site. The Northern Ireland Trauma Network set up a trauma triage tool which helps paramedics make decisions to take more patients to the Royal Victoria Hospital, which is a trauma centre, and bypasses multiple other hospitals. Effectively, Antrim, Ulster and Craigavon hospitals are bypassed in the majority of cases of significant trauma and the patient is taken directly to the RVH as a main trauma centre. Alton McGalvin now sees approximately one third of the number of patients with significant trauma that attend the Royal Victoria Trauma Centre. 
The Royal has also initiated a call and send model, and this allows for a patient who attends any emergency department to be directly received in the RVH emergency department for ongoing management. The idea behind this is to decrease the amount of time it takes to get a patient accepted. Due to all of the above changes, deaths have decreased and lives have been saved. And we can monitor this via the returns from the TRADA Audit Research Network. All of this ties in with the changes in the HEM service, which provides medical input at the scene by both helicopter and land-based vehicles. There is no application, historically or otherwise, for any other healthcare problems where the term golden air can be used or implicated. Specifically, there is no relationship of any kind for emergency general surgery. As part of the question that was asked, uh, the issue regarding stroke treatment was brought up. There is a necessity for a patient to attend hospital as early as possible to allow for a CT scan of the brain to be carried out and treatment decided on within three hours. All patients who have heart attacks are now transported via ambulance to either Alton or the RVH for emergency angioplasty. This is the case across Northern Ireland. Again, there's very good evidence that death has <coughs> increased in cardiology and patients have a much better outcome with this model. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brendan. Um, and John, one other piece of information that we just wanted to share with Council today um, is around con continued significant investment in Southwest Acute Diagnostic Infrastructure. So, as part of continued significant investment in Southwest Acute Hospital's diagnostic infrastructure, um, a new MRI scanner will be installed in the radiology department at the hospital in the coming weeks. The replacement of the MRI scanner is the next stage of equipment upgrade for Southwest Acute Hospital, totaling £1.7 million of investment. This includes the recent instalment of a new CT scanner and digital radiography rooms. A new mobile image intensifier for Southwest Acute Theatres is also due to be delivered in the coming months. In order to provide continuity of service for patients during the replacement of MRI scanner, we've got rental of a mobile MRI unit to make sure that patients don't have to go elsewhere to have their scans. Work to install the mobile MRI will commence in the coming days with the delivery of mobile MRI scanner confirmed from mid-February. Tracy McIver, our Radiology Services Manager for the Western Health and Social Care Trust, has said that we are delighted that these essential diagnostic radiology equipments at SWA are being updated, which includes that new MRI scanner and installation over the next few weeks. The South West Acute Hospital provides a local MRI service for patients from Fermanagh and Tyrone and also delivers the trust-wide cardiac MRI um, scanning service. Replacement of the MRI scanner in SWA is essential to provide a high quality, safe and effective and efficient diagnostic service for the trust population. All recently replaced equipment was installed 10 years ago and thanks to advances in technology, new equipment for CT and MRI scanning will reduce scanning times and enhance diagnostic capabilities. We look forward to continuing to provide the very best quality of service to the Fermanagh and Tyrone communities for which we serve. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I'll uh, just mention that um, I you you did make a comment that uh, you know that we the public needs to come together. But uh, we as public representatives and people that have concerns about the way that the process for both general surgery and recruitment within the Western Trust, uh, we're not going to apologize for to keep hold you to account and say that this is, you know, complete mismanagement, both at uh, senior management and at board level, because it seems that it is Acne Galvin Central and uh, you know you have said you have gone out and gone out for recruitment for so many uh, but you know the buck stops uh, at the senior management team and the board uh, and we are not going to apologize um, we know that this is a fantastic place to work but uh, only for the outset of the Fermanagh and Oma District Council we wouldn't have done the video to show what SWA can do this was from councillors that said, you know, we need to promote it more. But uh, definitely, uh, 
the public cannot be blamed or any group or individual can't be blamed for what you know the trust has done uh, we will hold you to account and we're not going to apologize for it uh, you need to do a lot lot more and uh, I, I said at the meeting in the bond acre that uh, you have to be uh, make it more attractive for people to come here uh, it's a good place to live with good education um, but there is a lot more that can be done on your side for to recruit people to come here and uh, it is important that uh, consultants uh, is in place at all times so um, Mr. Coyle, I'd like to make a point just before you move on I think it's very important that you reflect on your duty and your actions as well. We need to have an air of positivity about new recruitment in Southwest Acute Hospital. It is reasonable for you to ask questions, but it is fair to say that you have to help us with this positivity so that we can recruit. And that is something that you can do, and I think that you do have to reflect on that. We, Brendan, do not talk, do not talk to us like that we are, uh, you know, stupid. Uh, we know don't exactly... Think, I don't think I, I, don't think I talked... I asked, I asked if not, you could have some look, positivity, please. Yes, I, I am always positive. And I was one of the members that wanted the video. So I would always be positive. I work in the place. I see the good people that are working there. But uh, so many people have left because of HR problems and senior management not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So uh, you need to reflect and make sure that you are uh, in the right frame of mind to support workers, to support uh, staff coming in and retaining them. So just don't, uh, don't blame it all on us. We will be positive when uh, we have shown over the last number of weeks the trust has, cannot be trusted, so it works two ways, and uh, it needs to be done in that fashion. So when you start to be uh, truthful and honest and respectful at so all Mr. Meetings, Mr. Coyle, Mr. Coyle, I'm going to have to stop you there. I so you're the word Coyle, so uh, I, chair. I will move on to Councillor Warrington. Can I, can I ask you to clarify Make your sure statement that you're truthful? And, uh, come in and speak. Well, thank you, Chair, uh, for for allowing me in. Um, just certainly on on uh, to come on to the back of some of what you've already said. Uh, I certainly, from my perspective, as uh, uh, a, a a person who uses the SWA continually, uh, I've always tried to be positive with it and always tried to talk it up. But I think we'll be excused to to if it's that is difficult at the minute. Um, I certainly welcome the 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 new uh, investment in, in equipment, especially in the radiology equipment. But going on on what we've already been told about the uh, feeling that there was no applications uh, for that department. Um, it's okay having the equipment, but we obviously it's a bit like a train. You have to train, but you need somebody to drive it. So certainly we need somebody to be able to to uh, to use this equipment. It's hardly surprising that there has been no applicants uh, whenever any interested party reads the ongoing shambles about a trust that's leading us head forced into a cul-de-sac with their contradictory messages that's been related to the public and to us as elected representatives. And I make no apology for that uh, either for that comment. There is no doubt there has been mixed messages coming from the trust. Um, you know, Councillor Coyle also uh, referred to um, to the Acnegelvin uh, Galvin Centre. Well, we had another word that we used that we developed here about five years ago. Uh, we called it dairyization, um, and certainly there has to be a certain uh, a certain bit of that on it. I, I want to ask one question on the back of those comments. Um, how many adverse incidents have been associated with the change? These don't necessarily have to be serious adverse ones, but all adverse with the longest length of a time, a patient requiring ongo ongoing transfer 
has had the weight uh, at the SWA before appropriate transportation uh, accompanying staff arrived. Um, so if we could have uh, an update there, and please, uh, an accurate update, um, because you'll appreciate as councillors, we are, are hearing uh, messages from our constituents as well. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, if I can maybe go back to the first point about radiology. Um, a local consultant has joined that team on a, on a permanent, uh, permanent basis um, two weeks ago. And just to make the point, and I made the point through the statement that there are two international recruits, one which will start at the end of March 2023, and another radiologist has also been appointed on the 14th of February 2023. So there is a very active recruitment um, plan and process through our international medical recruitment um, teams. And as I said, um, that is a big focus of us in terms of our workforce because we know posts can be difficult to attract to and the trust have invested significantly in terms of that international recruitment team. When we appoint people and when we get, first get a sign that somebody is willing to come to work with us, we try to put that person in contact with another international medical recruit that works um, in the trust from their country. There is a very significant wraparound process um, to, to bring people or bring people here with schools, um, offers of accommodation. So it's a very focused um, piece. Um, Victor, if I can just pick up on the on the one of the other aspects in terms of waiting times to be transferred. We are not aware of significant waiting times for patients to be transferred into hospital. Um, that, from our perspective, using our, our private provider, tends to be a very slick um, process which happens in a timely way. Um, the issue in terms of any adverse incidents, Brendan um, will pick that piece up. So we have had one patient who remained in the Southwest Acute Hospital for longer than we would have preferred. However, at a later stage, the patient was reviewed by a medical consultant and the patient, in fact, had no surgical problems. I'm being limited with the information that I'm giving because I have to protect patient confidentiality. Uh, Victor, do you want a supplementary? <coughs> Councillor Warrington. Sorry, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you've, sorry, thanks for that information. Um, obviously, you've mentioned a locum radiologist, uh, which has been taken on. You know, locums always scare me um, because locum. Can, Victor, can I, sorry, Victor, can I just interrupt? It's actually an international doctor, so it's a. It's sorry, a yeah, I would prefer that you would interrupt me through the chair, and I will certainly take interruptions. But I, I would I would like the 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 courtesy of finishing my point. Um, locums, for the sheer cost of locums, is obviously it puts a lot of pressure on our finances. And I, I'm not saying the locum the locum's probably a fantastic guy, but he is what he is. He's still a locum. He's only there. He's there because of the high rate of money. I would assume that he's getting, and will move on um, later on. So. Uh, that's the point I want to make. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So I just clarif clarify that point for, for Victor. It is actually a permanent um, international recruit. Victor, that was my error. But just to make the point, um, you know, across Northern Ireland, services um, do require locum support um, where there are vacancies and where there are temporary vacancies. And, and you're right. We want to make sure that we spend the public's money as wisely as we can. Um, but we're, locums will continue to make make up uh, an important part of our workforce um, as we work our way through. Um, we bring them through a very strict process when they come into the organisation, so um, we will be reliant on them as we move forward. Um, but as um, we said at the outset, and I said through some of my work, um, getting some of that important positive narrative now back around SWA um, from ourselves collectively um, is really important in terms of attracting workforce um, to um, Tyrone and Fermanagh, um, so that will be welcomed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Matthew Bale. Uh, thank you for letting me in, Chair. I suppose sitting here, you know, at uh, every meeting we're told recruitment is a big issue. And so I, I would like to ask the Trust, if you'll allow me, Chair, just simply ask what work have they done with their counterparts on the British mainland? Romananoma isn't the only rural area of the United Kingdom. Um, surely, if recruitment's an issue here, it's an issue elsewhere. What, what is the mainland doing to resolve this problem? And then, Jerry, let me make a comment as well. Um, 
a little bit concerned and a little bit disappointed disappointed that the trust is slowly backing away from this concept of a golden hour. It was said today, and there was a piece in the Belfast Live at the end of last year as well. Um, and I, I I see parallels with the old uh, County Tyrone Hospital and what's happened in its wa. And you know, I've I've been reading through a few of the meetings, um, back in the late two uh, thousands of the um of the um meetings between MLAs and the trust. This concept of the golden hour is is being used consistently in, in relation to discussing the Tyrone County Hospital. Um, I, I've one up. I've one random meeting in front of me, and when talking about ambulance services, and um, one of the doctors said. Uh, they understand the golden hour concept when someone has a life-threatening injury he or she requires care within 60 minutes if their chances of survival are to be maximized so i why is it only now that the trust is backing away or at least um you know medical professionals are backing away of this golden hour concept because surely if if if, if there's no if it's not evidence-based the the uh, the nice way is golden hour should have been dropped years ago. So, but on those comments, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Mark, or yeah. you so, that? so with regards to recruitment, um, there is a shortage of general surgeons across the UK. All of the advertisements that we put in go into the BMJ, it's the British Medical Journal. That is a journal that's available to all doctors. That would be the primary source of recruitment across the UK and is certainly available to all doctors in England, Scotland and Wales. Thank you. Chair, um, Chair just to come back, so just, yes. to, just to confirm, the Western, the Western Trust has not directly engaged with any other rural hospitals throughout the rest of the United Kingdom. Just to make that, just to make that clear. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Diana Armstrong, can I, maybe, can, I, can I maybe just respond to that? Um, because as part of the review of general surgery within the Western Trust, we have um, developed links with Scotland. We've also um, have critical friends um, in England where we have sought expertise and sought expert advice um, in terms of the critical nature, um, in, in terms of the critical needs, in terms of staffing and recruitment that we have identified within Southwest Acute. So I think it is fair to say that we have engaged um, professionally um, with medics and senior medics um, in Scotland and in, in England as well to, to, to help us, I suppose, navigate the challenges um, that we find ourselves in with Southwest Acute. So we have been seeking advice. So I just want to make that point of clarity. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Thank you, Chair. And at the outset, I'd like to welcome um, the, the meeting this morning, your presence at the meeting. I mean, you can understand the, the anger and concern uh, that there is in the room from councillors, but it is good that we remain engaged. And I, I do welcome that. And there are other matters coming up on the agenda. Um, firstly, well, a couple of things I wanted to say have been covered. But to me, the fundamental question is there are so many uh, positions here being advertised and you talk about negative negativity it, it isn't a good look it's really not a good look for the trust particularly for the trust in SWA um, so really what I'd like to know further what other incentives you are offering it has been mentioned where um, applicants seek accommodation they, they they need assistance with accommodation is that being provided is that an incentive that's been provided um, also um, if if no one applies or if no one is successful in this process, what is the trust planning to do following that? It's not certain that you're going to be able to recruit because you do say that internationally or that, that there is a shortage of applicants. So that, that's one point I'd like answered. Secondly, on the CT scanner, I welcome the, the new the new equipment, but again, picking up on the point of workforce planning and training, um, it's my understanding that um, within Diagnostic CT, the consultant there will be leaving, that someone is working their notice. Is there... Is recruitment in place? Is training in place for for using the new the new CT scanner? It's it's really just to answer those two questions at this point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, so, so John, John, if it's okay, I'm going to ask um, Karen Harkin to pick up the incentives bit piece, please, first. Yep. And then Brendan will answer the other two points around the greater workforce in the UK and then that CT piece around um, the CT scanner, mm -hmm. um, if that's okay. Yep, thanks, um, Grant. Okay, Councillor Armstrong, just to, to advise in, in relation to incentives at, at up to date, we would not have met the criteria to apply to the Department of Health to put incentives in place for um, any of these posts in particular. Um, so, however, we are now looking at a range of posts within the organisation and our capacity to make a business case application to the Department of Health um, to put incentives in place. So it's not something that the trust has the discretion to do as of its own right. We need to develop a business case and put that to the Department of Health. And that is, is being looked at um, in, in, at the minute. Um, I mean, the, the workforce position in relation to general surgery has deteriorated quite significantly over the last 18 months. So that, that is the reason that this would not have been considered uh, to date, because in, in previous years we have recruited uh, to the vacancies that were there. Um, we, we really have fallen victim to a range of circumstances over the course of the, of the last um, 18 months in, in relation to um, general surgery in particular in SWA. Okay, thank you, Karen. Brendan? Yeah, so I think unfortunately we do have to look at the wider context here. It gives me no great pleasure to tell you that there are vacancies in every single team in every single hospital across Northern Ireland and probably the UK. So the reality is we are facing a health force crisis in the NHS that is not limited to or specifically focused on Southwest Acute or the smaller hospitals in Northern Ireland. So we do have to put that into context. It's difficult to recruit to every position right now. And that, that is something that we are working hard on, but there are multiple fronts that we have to cover. Now, with regards to the question on diagnostic radiology, all radiology consultants are diagnostic radiology. I think, unfortunately, you're probably referring to interventional radiology. So I did have a meeting with the radiology management team yesterday afternoon, and we do have a plan to increase the interventional radiology cover in the Southwest Acute site. And also, we're going to potentially improve the cover on site in OMA as well. Thank you. Uh, supplementary, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. It's just the question on, uh, has not been answered, um, on whether this, if the recruitment is unsuccessful, where does the trust sit in terms of cover um, for these positions? Um, that, that's really, I'd like that answered. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I take that. I suppose, Councillor Armstrong, we, we take it a step at a time. Uh, what I would say to you is the, the general surgery post is due to close today and we do have applicants uh, for that general surgery post. So uh, we will work through the process of shortlisting and, and interviewing, hopefully, uh, those applicants in, in the first instance. If, if after shortlisting we um, are not successful, then we will look at our other options and um, Brendan has already talked to you about the range of, of things that we do. So we have an international recruitment process that we look at and we have a medical local team within the trust that, that works very hard um, with those medical locum agencies. So those would be our next steps if uh, we are unable to recruit. But we do have a number of applicants for the post that is due to close today. So I would be hopeful um, that we would be in a position where we are able to, to put interviews in place. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Councillor Adam Gannon. Thank you, Chair. First, a, a comment and, and then a few questions. Um, you know, I think the first thing I, I want to do is ask for, for honesty here today and, and direct answers to the questions posed by, by councillors. There is talk of this negative uh, narrative, but a lot of the damage and this negative narrative has been done by the trust to itself in the opinion of the public. And there are massive concerns out there. You know, you said you want us to work with you. But again, it starts with honesty. And as far as the public opinion is concerned, and, and many people in the public have said this to me, is that the trust has no integrity and doesn't care about lives and for mana. And, and this is something that people here are saying. And the trust have brought this 
uh, about themselves, this negative public narrative. And there was an attempt nearly to shift blame to the likes of yourself, Chair, at the start of this meeting, which is just totally unacceptable, I think, uh, before the Trust tells councillors to reflect on actions, they need to be self-reflective themselves and admit where there have been mistakes fully and openly and honestly, and then we can work together. And we do want to work together. We've worked together in the past. But to my uh, questions, Chair, um, relating uh, OBS uh, and Gainey, uh, have there been any consultant resignations tendered? How many have been tendered? And how long until the end of any notice periods? Has the availability of locum cover again for OBS and Gainey changed in any way since December, uh, since the December changes to emergency general surgery? For example, there may have been still sufficient cover, but could there have been on average, say, three locums available prior to the change? And now there may only be one or two. Have there been any changes there? My next question, Chair, is have any local clinicians within OBS and Gainey made management aware of concerns relating to the withdrawal of emergency general surgery and its impact on their ability to safely do their job in their professional opinions? And what have the trusts done to try and address this? There was a question asked by Councillor Warrington um, about adverse impacts since change to emergency general surgery, and I don't think it was it was fully answered. Um, the, uh, the answer was that there was a longer than preferred wait what time can a definitive time be put up here today on what is the preferred wait time so what time would they deem to be unperformed uh, unpreferred uh, in relation to transfers chair uh, that's my questions for now thank you thank you mark or who's thank you. Thank you. yeah and then ben, i'll take the obs and gainy piece so, so we have had one resignation and we currently have two locums in place. So we have a fully functioning, fully staffed call and daytime rota. And just to make the point as well too, that we're back out the ad again as well too for obstetrics and gynaecology. Um, and we're also at the international recruitment as well. So um, there, there, there are robust plans in terms of recruitment in place for, for, for that service. And the other, in terms of in terms of in terms of travel times, um, we there are no other specific issues um, relating to transfer. The transfer piece, um, essentially, with our private provider, has worked well since the outset of this process. Um, we do meet clinicians on a regular basis from Southern Trust, from Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, and from clinicians North and Southern Sector. Um, there, there was a. Um, a, a daily safety huddle up until last week when we changed that system and process and we've changed that now to twice weekly because the systems and the processes are becoming more embedded in practice and we are seeing less issues in terms of communications across the service areas. So those conversations do exist and do take place on a regular basis. If there's a point for escalation, then that would happen at that specific time. But I'm not aware of any um, significant issues in relation to um, issues that relate specifically to travel um, and transfer of patients um, within Fermanagh um, and Tyrone. Um, yesterday we had um, our, our, um, our, our, our board um, which is overseen by the chief executive. Nias were at that 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 call and at that table. Um, so at this point in time, we're not we're not highlighting specific issues relating to travel. May I come back in there, Chair, briefly? Um, a number of questions not answered there, and I appreciate the answers that I was given. But I'm going to repeat a couple of questions and ask for those answers. Um, has the availability of any locum cover for OBS and Gainey changed in any way? since December, for example, three previously might have been available for a cover shift, and now there may only be one on average, please. Um, relating to the waiting time for transfer, I will repeat, I, I take Mark's point on board, but I want to know what is the preferred wait time that uh, Mr. Dr. Lavery mentioned there. He said, one patient stay beyond the preferred wait time. What is the preferred wait, wait time for this? Chair, and finally, the other question, which was related to Obs and Gainey, is have any local clinicians made management aware of concerns, their concerns relating to the withdrawal of emergency general surgery and its impact on their ability to safely do their job 
in their professional opinion. Have any staff raised concerns? Thank you, Chair. Okay, so there's a couple of bits um, I'll pick up, Councillor Gannon, if that's okay, in terms of availability, in terms of rota for obstetrics and gynaecology. The rota is fully compliant at this point in time um, to support daytime work and, and out of call or out of hours arrangements across seven days of the week. Um, that is a rota that has been in place for um, a long period of time uh, and that continues to be compliant with very good oversight um, by service managers on a daily basis. Um, as part of this change, um, and as part of this work as well too, I oversee um, weekly sessions with the obstetrics and gynaecology team um, and have a very broad plan working with them, with HR, um, to improve our systems, improve our processes, make sure that they work and work very well. Um, I'm also working very robustly with them on a rebuild plan um, for elective sessions um, back in theatre as well too, which is one of the other commitments um, that the Chief Executive and the Trust um, made at the outset of this change. So those plans are, are very much a fit and, and we'd met with them just yesterday to advise them of what sessions they would have and when they would be coming on stream. In terms of the NIAS bit and in terms of the, the ambulance wait piece, um, that is a patient by patient um, individual case. If a patient comes to Southwest Acute, requires intervention, requires stabilisation, requires fluids, um, that patient may well not be transferred for an hour, could not be maybe ready for transfer for an hour and a half until clinicians are satisfied that that patient's um, clinical condition is safe to transfer. If it has to be done and has to be done early and has to be done quickly, that will be done through NIAS colleagues um, as part of blue light emergency arrangements and may well require um, support from um, one of the doctors um, potentially to travel with the patient. So it is very much on a patient by patient basis. Um, obviously then we will also use um, our private ambulance transfers for patients that are low risk um, to avoid any significant impact on capacity and capability for Northern Ireland Ambulance Service um, who are continuing to operate in that area and provide a service to the population. Um, Brendan may well want to pick on, on some of the other bits just around obstetrics and gynae, if that's all right. Yeah, so as you're aware, there was a letter which was received by the Trust in, in December of last year. This has been answered with help of the local Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology representative for Northern Ireland and the Western Trust clinical lead. There were a number of mitigations, three in total, all of which have been fully implemented. There has been no further formal approach made by any obstetrics and gynaecology staff who work in South West Acute. And again, I'd just like to add to the point that there is a regular interaction um, led by myself with that team um, in a very focused way as we move our way through um, the temporary change. Okay. Uh, next, we have Councillor Barry McIldoff. Thanks, John, uh, and your role as chair of this committee. Thank you, John. And also welcome our trust colleagues. Um, I'm in the Bonacre here at the minute and I've been accommodated very well by George and the team, thanks to them. But there's a very good event on here this morning. This will just take two sentences before I move to the point. Very good event here this morning. Um, children looked after. It's care day and it's great to meet the social workers from the trust and the, the team, you know, who are doing great work with children who are looked after. And there's an activities day here and a very happy day here at the Bonacre just to record that. And then moving on into the you know these the, the difficult topic, um, I want to just seek a restatement of trust commitment to acute maternity services at SWA. You know it's been said in various ways, but you know OBS and gynae and maternity all related. Um, really, what I'm doing is, and it comes from my OMA experience, is seeking uh, a commitment from the Trust in the context of today's meeting to the future of acute maternity services at SWA, you know, long-term stability. What risks and threats might emerge or arise in the future which could possibly undermine this stability? And, you know, what actions would be taken in the here and now to prevent those risks and threats? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Barry. I'll let Brendan take that. So I suppose probably the simplest way of explaining this, Barry, is there is a consultation going on in the Northern Trust regarding maternity services in Causeway. Um, one of the outcomes is that they will be removing maternity services from Causeway. If this happens, and it is one of the, it's one of the likely possibilities, we would expect that we will gain 
between three and 400 births from that area. At this moment in time, we are struggling to provide care for all of the patients that we see in Alton Kelvin due to her critical space. So very, very simply, Barry, we need the Southwest Acute Maternity Unit to stay open. There is no way in the world that we would attempt to supply services to pregnant women for the dairy area, for the causeway area, and for the Southwest. It very, very simply, it would not be possible. So that, that, that's to give you an idea of the logistics around it, Barry. We are utterly committed to continuing the service there. We will keep recruitment ongoing. We will backfill with locums. We will get international recruits in. We will do whatever is required. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, I have three more councillors and I do know that uh, I really do want to get item seven. Uh, can you can you afford another 10 15 minutes I, I think i think if we i think if we can probably run a bit over time um john but we won't have significant time to run over and we would be keen that we hear the stories around um industrial action and the police from kevin on cams as well because they are two um key and crucial aspects that you'll want to be cited on i think yeah. so i'll uh, just ask um councillor stevens and uh, if you can keep it uh, concise. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will keep this concise. Uh, the Trust has asked the councillors to help them promote the SWA. Uh, what are they doing to promote the SWA as a good place uh, to work when we hear that there has been problems with staff and the HR? Um, we can do all we can. We will work for the SWA but we need cooperation from the Trust to uh, help us uh, promote everything. The other thing is, he chatted about general surger surgeons probably coming on. There was a problem, I thought, with uh, other services within Southwest Acute Hospital that we couldn't have emergency general surgery. What progression has been made on that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start with what we're doing. So um, one of the highly accredited leads down there has taken on a project. So I've asked her to set up a working group of staff across Southwest Acute Hospital. And it's really to try and give the staff a voice to start to change some of the negativity, to talk about the issues that we have and to look for solutions. So that, that will be starting within the next few weeks. That will be led by the Southwest clinicians themselves. Um, on a personal level, I interact with them on really a, almost a daily basis, as does Mark. I've been in the Southwest Acute on Monday. I think, Mark, you were there yesterday. yesterday. So we, we do interact quite significantly with our valued staff down there. Thank you, Brenda. OK. Um, Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much, Chair. And thanks to uh, the team from the Trust this morning for being on and answering the questions. Uh, people may not like some of the answers, but anyway, they're here and uh, that's to be welcomed. Uh, just coming from an anomaly based perspective, uh, Mark, uh, I suppose I've heard of the rundown of Tyrone County Hospital from, uh, from about 1978 onwards. And all went before that and uh, since that, and the loss of maternity services at the uh, Tyrone County Hospital. And, and I, believe, I believe there's nothing now in the Tyrone area at all in, in that way. There's a couple of comments that you made this morning there with regard to the golden hour. I find that I, I wasn't aware of that now. You know, every time I've been on a meeting, we've heard about the golden hour. So that that's, uh, and I, I don't want, some of my colleagues have already mentioned this, so I know we're short of time and I don't want to keep going on about it. But uh, some of the stuff that came over the day, Mark, you've read out statements and I don't think we have had the opportunity to see all that, those briefing papers that you've had. Can we get those sent to us? I think that would be beneficial in the way forward. I would also take this opportunity to welcome uh, the the new scanning equipment in the Southwest Acute Hospital, Dennis Gill. So thanks for letting me in, Chair. No more short of time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Um, Mark. 
I, I'm sure we'll be happy to share that information, John, um, with with yourself and Alison. That won't be an issue from our perspective. That's okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Josephine Deacon. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks to Mark, Brendan, and colleagues from the Western Trust for joining us uh, this morning. My apologies, Chair, for joining the meeting late. I had actually blocked out uh, my, my clinic from ten, uh, from eleven thirty, but in the event uh, it didn't happen. Um, no, it's just very briefly, uh, Chair. I, I mean, I note uh, Brendan's response to Councillor McIlduff's query regarding. Uh, commitment to the uh, maternity services in Southwest Acute, and and indeed, um, you know, we are uh, extremely anxious about those services, and they are quite critical. Um, I represent OMA, but they're very critical to the people of OMA and and as well as Fermanagh. But just the answer, Chair, that Brendan give gave to Barry. Uh, I mean, about ongoing recruitment and uh, uh, backfilling with locums and so on. I mean, this strategy was employed um, in respect of the uh, acute surgical services and, and wasn't successful. You know, if I could just ask Brendan, what what would differentiate the uh, uh, Obzengaini service from acute surgery uh, in terms of your being more successful in your recruitment campaign for obstetrics. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Josephine. Okay, so Josephine, I suppose the first thing is we've got a core group of substantive consultants that remain. We also have availability of locums. One of the problems being when we had decreasing number of general surgeons, we were unable to find locums of adequate quality to fill that. So to be fair, the two, the two situations are actually very different. OK, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that and thank you for that clarification, Chair. Thank you. Okay. John, just, John, just in, yeah, in, terms of, in terms of time, um, Kevin's probably going to need 10 minutes and Karen's probably going to need five minutes as well too. So we have about 15 minutes probably of, of presentation time uh, and we want to get those points across and, and make sure the council are aware of them. So it's just to give you, give you a sense of what, what we need time-wise, OK? That's that's all the councillors done. So we're at twelve twenty two. So um, we will start. Uh, we'll move now to item number seven, and we'll take the presentation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Somebody, maybe we can't see the screen being shared, can we? Can we see the screen share? Can you see it, John? Uh, no, I don't know. Alison, I think it, it's going to be chair, or sorry, shared at our end, Chair. I think uh, okay. we'll be sharing that so it should be visible to all participants. Thank you. Can you, Alison, could you let us know whenever you can see it? Because we, we can't see it at our yeah. end. Um, it, it, oh, it's not up for us yet either, <laughs> Mark. No, sorry, we'll certainly, yeah. we'll certainly let you know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, Chair, just maybe check with Peter if we're having any difficulties at our end, Peter. Peter. Sorry, Chair, uh, we're working through that. We'll try and get it sorted as quickly as possible. Okay. Technology is great when it works. Is it possible, Chair, while we're waiting, that uh, we could... Indu industrial action update, or...? No, that... well, uh, I know it probably is going to take a wee while. Uh, I would be very interested in hearing uh, the neurology service staffing. You're... Chair, just to say, I think I've got it. I can share from my screen, if, if okay. uh, we'll just try... Can I see yeah. if people are... Yeah, yeah, that's all there now. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Well, and then maybe just chair, if I might ask from trust colleagues, just to let me know when you need the slides moved on, and I'll do that. 
<coughs> Perfect, Alison. Thank you. We can see that okay from our perspective as well. So I'll, ha I'll hand you over to Kevin. And Kevin, you just want to do an introduction just in terms of your background and where you work just before you start, please. Thank you, Alison. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll say next slide or whatever when we move on. So I appreciate your help with the AT. Uh, look, can I thank the members, first of all, as well, the subcommittee, just for the opportunity uh, to give an update just of current position with CAMS. My name is Kevin Duffy. Uh, I'm the Assistant Director for Child Health and Disability and of Responsibility for CAMS. Uh, so today, I, I know we're pushed for time and, and obviously a very important conversation just that, that we've had. So I try and go through as, as, as quickly as succinctly as I can. Uh, today, I hope to provide a, a brief overview of the services provided by our CAMS service. Uh, some information about the demand for services and the breakdown that, that we have for each service area. Uh, an overview of the staff and post that we have within some of the specific areas that we deal with. Uh, information obviously regarding the waiting list and some of our, our breaching times. And I'll finish with some of the, the general challenges that we have and opportunities we have within the delivery of CAM services and some of my own priorities over the next three to six months. So next slide there, just please. Okay, so just a, a general overview. I know that a lot of people are familiar with the CAM service. Sorry, can we just go back one? Yeah. Okay. So this is just a, an overview of the type of services that's provided uh, through CAMS. You know, the first there, we have our tier two services of primary mental health. Primary mental health generally is, it focuses on early intervention and prevention. Uh, it's uh, moderate, what you would consider moderate to mental health presentations. Uh, usually, it's young people who present with anxiety, emotional behavioural disturbance, low mood. A lot of young people in this category would be school refusers that has been affected, or their, their, their general that is affecting, and they're, they're refusing schools. So it's just a bit of a flavour of some of the, the young people that present in that category. Our step three service, we would tend to be moderate to severe. Uh, within this category of young people suffering from depression and sense of self-harm, uh, a lot of stuff that we would hear around now about gender issues, severe anxiety, psychotic conditions, and neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, as we will see later in the presentation, this is uh, usually our, our highest source of referrals for young people suffering in this category. Uh, the next we have there is our CAM and, and drug and alcohol, or our, our CAM's drug and alcohol service. Our ADHD service, what we provide is a multidisciplinary assessment uh, we provide a review and monitoring uh, uh, service and, and medication review. I'll talk a wee bit more about that just as we go on. And we have our eating dis disorder service, which I'll, I'll say a wee bit more about too later. Next slide, just. So the next slide shows the total number of referrals received by the CAM service. Now this is broken down between our northern and southern sector. Uh, it looks blue there, so our northern sector is blue and the, the, the other colour is the southern sector, orange or yellow or whatever. So I, just a couple of things pulling out from there. Uh, and, and first of all, just to note, 22, 23 figures, a projected figure based on the numbers from December. So we can see from the graph there, look, I, I'll give you a bit of time maybe to look at it and I'll talk, but just there are following referrals during COVID. Uh, Followed by you know an increase then in the overall referral rate, not unexpected, just on 21, 22 following COVID. And we're predicting that that will be a similar rate of referral then for, for 22, 23. Um, there was a sharp rise after the COVID. Uh, and again, we analysed that and looked at it. I know the numbers went down in COVID for various reasons. Went up. One of the things that we're looking at and one of the things we're interested in from McCann's perspective at this stage is that the numbers tell some story in themselves in terms of the, the, mm -hmm. the, the number of referrals that are coming in. But what we're seeing and, and the story maybe coming out of, of COVID and what we're, 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 we're experiencing a bit more is the level of complexity in terms of the young people that's, that's presenting. Uh, and, and that's something that uh, we need to keep analyzing and keep looking at in terms of our responses to that. And particularly, uh, you know, we've seen something around eating disorders that caused us a lot of concern and, and we had to focus on it. But, and, you know, looking at it, I think that was shared by uh, regional shared around uh, the other trust areas of, of some of the issues for young people during COVID and then presenting afterwards with, with some difficulties. 
so next slide. So the next slide shows a breakdown. Uh, it's difficult for me to read there on, on the screen just in terms of numbers, but the breakdown, I, I outlined the type of uh, referrals that we've come in in service areas. Uh, are very, and I said that tier two services is by far the biggest category of referrals. Um, withdraw your attention alongside the number of referrals coming on for each category then as our staff complement. You know, so the pie chart there in the yellow part of it shows the referrals are the, the staff that we have currently in post dealing with our, our tier three referrals, again, which uh, are higher. You know, we have about 700 referrals, including our, our tier three and crisis referrals. We have about eight staff currently within the southern sector dealing with that. You know, so it, it works out at about 15 per week. And you can imagine then the complexity that's going on within some of them uh, young people that's presenting the length of intervention, or the type of intervention that's required, the length of intervention that's required uh, is very challenging for us in terms of capacity. Uh, one of the interesting things then, again, that we look at and see in the next slide, one of the big challenges for us uh, is in the whole area of ADHD, the service provision that we have in terms of diagnosis and then the monitoring and review of young people who are diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, we have a very small commission service for this. We have one specialist nurse in post. And the challenge for us in terms of priority is pulling staff from all areas to try and address and meet this need as it is increasing. Uh, and and the, the challenge for us, as for many parts of the service, is just prioritizing and, and uh, prioritizing need as it comes on, prioritizing uh, young people's uh, whoever and sometimes require an emergency response and how best to use the finite resources that we have. Next slide. This is in relation to our waiting list and our breaching, breaching figures within southern area or southern section of our CAM service. And the waiting list, you know, we hold our hands up to it, it remains an ongoing challenge for us. Now, as I mentioned previously, particularly in relation to our ADHD service delivery, and you can see just in the bottom right-hand corner some of the figures there, uh, that ADHD in particular would uh, account for the vast majority of, of uh, reporting that we would have in relation to uh, our waiting list and our breaching figures. Uh, Part of the difficulty that we have, as I said, is diverting staff from different areas to meet this need. Uh, and that is an ongoing challenge and something that uh, we, we, we have to continually try and plan for and, and try and work with our college and the department on uh, SPPG in terms of commissioning additional services for this area in particular. Uh, you can see just on the left hand side of that, some of the narrative would indicate that our, our response to there are crisis response and our response to eating disorders referrals are within five days and we have no breach in relation to that. Uh, we have made some progress, we've made some good progress, and I want to acknowledge that in all areas of our waiting times, and breaching numbers are on trend to decrease from 22. So we've turned the curve there, but from 22 uh, for this year, where the numbers waiting and the numbers are breaching are going down. Uh, we have regular scrutiny, and rightly so, in relation to that. Uh, we have internal meetings in terms of our own performance and our operational delivery, and we meet regularly with uh, SPPG and Department of Health in terms of uh, how we're doing, or what we're doing, and, and how we're managing to try and address those those figures. Next slide. Okay, this is just I say I wanted to highlight just some of the ongoing challenges, and you, you know we've heard some of these these terms or these things being mentioned about reality and stuff earlier on in the conversations, recruitment and retention of staff, you know, we've heard it affecting different areas of services right across health and social care. For me, just want to highlight some of the priority areas for me and our staff and our service over the next few months. It's a continual challenge for us in terms of service redesign or service improvement. Uh, as the needs of young people change, as the challenges for communities and society change, we need to be flexible in our approach and have an agile approach in terms of how we uh, how we deliver. Uh, so we're constantly looking at that within the service. We have waiting list initiatives ongoing at present, uh, and we have service user and stakeholder engagement to help us uh, try and address 
uh, areas where we want to improve on and where we need to improve on and, and, and who we, should, we, we, we need to work with in order to do that. As I say, as, as was discussed earlier, recruitment and retention remains a challenge for us. Uh, workforce is limited in terms of the pull that we can pull from. We try to overcome some of the delays that we have control over. Uh, you know, we, we have access to NIA issues and stuff like that that we should be able to resolve, uh, or with the help of others, we could resolve. They make things easier for ourselves in terms of speeding up recruitment. Uh, the challenge for us then is about the workforce analysis. We have a very mixed workforce uh, in terms of skill level. So we need to be very clear of what the workforce says is needed to meet specific areas and to meet the need that, that, that is changing and the needs that's ongoing. One of the big issues for me and one of the, the, the primary concerns for me is in relation to prevention and early intervention. You know, and we've heard it so often about how can we provide the right, the right service at the right time, the right intervention at the right time for these young people. Uh, we want to prevent the escalation and create capacity, which is the real challenge for us, create capacity for us further in the system and our tier three specialist services. Additional funding, which we have got to date, will help us do this and access to more funding will help us achieve this better in the, in the longer term. Just by way of some up update, we have got some funding in relation to emotional wellbeing team in schools, which just over the last week or two, we've got sign off in terms of job descriptions. And I see it as a really positive move forward uh, in terms of us being able to provide a service in local schools right across your areas uh, in order to increase awareness, provide an education factor, a consultative role, and again, target and try and prevent some of the young people who are experiencing some difficulties escalating in, in terms of their own presentation. Uh, we have funding for occupational therapists at tier three, and tier three recruitment for this is ongoing. We have also funding for uh, practitioners in relation to eating disorders, family therapists, which, which will help us in bringing all our skill set in terms of how we deliver our services, particularly around eating disorders. And we have recently commenced recruitment for, post, uh, for all our vacant posts, particularly to shore up our tier three responses. <laughs> One of the challenges, particularly, and, and, and again, we touched on that a wee bit in some of the other discussions, was is the reality if some there is in Fermanagh, some there is in Oma. Uh, so for me, again, where we see the differences between there and, and some of the, the availability of services, particularly maybe that's available in the dairy area, it's about that collaborative and partnership working. Uh, some of this, the, the stakeholders that might be available and support services that might be available for some of our young people and families in dairy are just not there in, in uh, Oma and, and Fermanagh. So how can we support and, and help build, build that resource in order to work in a more collaborative way? I met, met just this week with the, the Chief Executive of Action for Children, who was looking for trust support in relation to her application for Peace Plus money uh, for a really uh, interesting and, and, and dynamic service that they're hoping to provide for young people with mental health. And we had absolutely no difficulty in, in you know, and and offering our support and collaboration in terms of trying to help them get over the line with any funding that might be available, which would really help us in terms of that earlier intervention and preventative piece. So that's something that we continue to work with them on, and hopefully they can be successful. We have set up a contract with Youth Life, who are helping us deliver and meet some of the the, the or address some of the issues around waiting lists and they're providing a service for us just recently and uh, our Oma and Fermanagh area as well. They have limited capacity, but again, it's, uh, we're thankful that we've been able to identify them to provide that service. But we want them up, we hope to, there's a scope and exercise through the Pathfinder, which has helped us identify another piece of work that we can deliver through schools, which hopefully will start fairly soon. And again, one of the challenges for us is that accessible community-based services, particularly when there's that rural aspect around uh, Oman for Mana area. So that's where we're at. Thank you for the opportunity. We no doubt have challenges going forward, uh, but I, I, I suppose genuinely uh, appreciate the support from the councillors on this subcommittee. Uh, we accept and appreciate that we, we, we must be accountable to yourselves and the public. There are difficulties ongoing, but we're doing what we can every day to try and improve the service that we deliver. Thank you.
questions now to Kevin or? John, John I'm just, I'm very conscious of time um, from our perspective and nobody wants to not spend the time on this very, this very important subject. But I know so many people here in the room with other commitments um, that will be already in their diary. So I am just really conscious and I know Karen has other information that she wants to share that's important as well. Sure, sure I can move very, very quickly. To councillor, yeah, quickly, uh, councillor Thompson. I, I just want thank thanks for for the presentation. I would like to get those presentations sent to us, and that's all I want. Yeah. Okay. The chief executive yeah. has it. Um, councillor Dehan. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, chair, and thank you, Kevin, for your presentation. Uh, you have. Uh, uh, given us a lot of information. I appreciate the challenges that you face in terms of your staffing compliments. Um, you didn't actually refer to any uh, ASD waiting times or anything relating to that service. Would it be possible uh, outside the meeting to let us have some information on that, Kevin, please, if that was readily available? Thank you. So, jo Thank you. Josephine, I think if you want, John, what we would propose if, if there are questions. Um, from the subcommittee and including what Josephine has asked for as well too, we would be happy to take those back via Oliver and provide written responses back to yourselves and the team um, for for next meeting if that if that is a, a potential solution for yourselves. Yes. Okay. Th thank yeah. you. Thank you, Chair. That's grand. Um, Do you want to have you a quick question? One sentence, John, and it'll be a written answer. Uh, to ask Kevin what program would be best for young people's mental health in a community setting. You know the way communities have health and well-being groups within sports clubs, etc. What would the trust recommend by way of programs that they could undertake to promote positive mental health among young people and to get that answer in writing? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Alison. Um, yeah, Chair, hopefully you can see the, I think I have Karen's slides up now. I know there's a slide yeah. delay. Okay, so Karen, there are two slides. Karen. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, members. So just to, to go through the slides um, very briefly, um, and maybe before I speak to the slides, just a couple of words of context. Um, I think it's important to, to know that we have very good relationships both locally and regionally um, with our trade unions, so, so both in the, in the Western Trust and across the whole of Northern Ireland. So I wouldn't want anything that I'm about to say to be interpreted as um, negative. Um, I suppose from both the trade union and employer side, we see this dispute as a dispute with central government um, in relation to pay because th th that is... Um, where the control lies in terms of, of resolving um, the dispute. Uh, it's worth um, just noting that many senior managers um, within the organisation are members of trade unions and we absolutely respect the right of trade union members um, to take industrial action both in terms of strike action and action sort of strike. So just a couple of pieces of context. Um, since the last update uh, came to trade unions, Unite have now also received their mandate for industrial action. So we now have Unison, NIPSA, RCN, GMB and Unite who have mandates for industrial action and, and who are taking industrial action. Um, Unite have significant representation in our um, labs and in our pharmacy area, uh, across the trust in, in other AHP areas as well. But, but those are areas that are now uh, beginning to be brought into the strike. Uh, RCM, who is the Royal College of Midwives, are currently balloting for industrial action and their ballot closes on the 7th of March. And we just received correspondence yesterday um, from one of the pharmacy trade unions who have indicated that they are also about to undertake a ballot um, for industrial action. Uh, we are dealing with both strike action and action short of strike on an ongoing basis. And you'll see there on the slide that we have had strikes on the 12th, the 15th and 20th of December, the 26th of January. And we have a strike next week on the 21st of February that involves all of the trade unions except RCN. Um, they are not striking on the 21st of February, but all of the other trade unions are striking on the 21st of February. Um, it's probably also worth just saying a word about action short of strike because strike action is very visible, the public see uh, when the strikes are happening, um, but action short of strike is as disruptive as if not more disruptive on services um, than strike action. Um, those of you who work with NHSC, so Councillor Coyle, um, Councillor Dehan and others will understand 
services run very much sometimes on, on discretionary effort. We really rely on our staff on a daily basis to go above and beyond um, what might be expected in order for ser services to be maintained. So in a position where we are experiencing action short of strike, that really does have a, a significant and detrimental impact on um, services as well. It is worth noting that one of the um, action short of strike that we had been experiencing was uh, the withdrawal of private cars due to a mileage issue. Um, and whenever this was brought to us by uh, trade unions, and, and it was NIPS in the first instance who brought it forward, um, and we spoke to the Department of Health regionally who had the capacity to do something about this, they have done something about it. And they have extended um, the secondary, uh, a temporary increase in the secondary mileage rate to the 30th of September. And that has dealt with um, that aspect of the industrial action. And we are no longer experiencing that action short of strike. So I think it's really important for members to know that the Department of Health have been very responsive to this in trying to do what they can um, to support. And we really need that sort of attention being brought at a national level to, to try to resolve this um, strike. We work very closely with trade union colleagues um, to seek derogations uh, to, allow, to allow us to maintain life preserving services. Um, and we have bronze and silver management structures within the trust that we use on an ongoing basis, but particularly coming up to the days of industrial action and on days of industrial action um, to manage the impacts. Next slide, please. Um, it is very difficult to describe to you the to, to properly describe to you the impacts that industrial action has within the service. It is absolutely massive, um, and I'm sure you will have been hearing that from um, your constituents. Uh, but all services across the trust are impacted by industrial action. We had been in a position where, in the early stages of the industrial action, we were able to. Um, avoid impact on um, our most critically ill um, patients, so, so patients who would have been um, listed for red flag or urgent surgery and procedures. That is no longer the case. Um, and in December, we did have some, or sorry, in January, we did have some impacts on, on red flag and urgent patients. And we do have the potential uh, for some of that to happen now again on the 21st of February. So um, this, this is a very uh, difficult position for, for services to, um, to maintain. Um, and even though we may agree some derogations with trade unions, individual trade union members are not required to work to those derogations. They still have the right to take industrial action if they wish to do that. Um, and that has certainly been the case in, in some of what we have experienced in, in recent strikes as well. Um, we have had significant impact to business as usual within the trust as well. Um, and I suppose what I would say to you is when managers and staff and trade union members are spending their time talking about how do we manage the downturn of services, how do we keep people safe during industrial action, we are not doing the work that we need to be doing on a day and daily basis to deliver services um, to keep people safe. And, and that is having an impact on our services. Um, the other impact that we're seeing is that partnership working with trade unions during the period of industrial action has been stood down locally and regionally, and, and that is also having an impact on how we can move some of those partnership areas forward. So I suppose just an update on where we are to, to elected members, and, and if you have any influence at all um, with uh, central government in order to try to get this resolved, um, it would be very helpful uh, because it, it is really having an impact on both our staff and our patients and clients. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, has any members any questions? No, uh, comprehensive uh, report, Karen, so um, no members have asked questions. Um, so thank you. Um, there is a list um, of questions that was submitted. Uh, Marker, what way do you intend or want to? I think you, if you're if you're if you're content, I think we'd like them to be shared with members. And if there are any other queries, um, if we can feed those back through Oliver or Chris, um, if you're content, Mr. Coyle, that will be um, our suggestion. We get responses, written responses to those questions. 
Uh, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chair. Could I, if, if I could, understanding the time restraints, if I could add a question, uh, um, a supplementary to question two about Coles Hill facility. It's specifically about Urbanstown Health Centre. Um, just asking, can the integrated services delivery team or any other WHSCT services be moved to another facility to free up space for the clinical team in Urbanstown Health Centre? Uh, and secondly, uh, there, they, I understand that the MDT program will be coming. I think Urbanstown tell us that they are second on the list of the rollout. Space will be needed to accommodate the team, both their admin and clinical uh, teams. Um, so planning will be required in advance of that. So it's just really a response on that as well, added to, to question two. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, Councillor Warrington. Thank you, Gerald. I don't want to hold the thing up. Um, it, it's come to my knowledge in the last 24 hours just that uh, we had the good news that uh, we had the good news that a contract had been awarded for the Maple Health Centre in Lisnaski. But it's my understanding uh, and information I received in the last 24 hours that Brookborough and Tempo are unfortunately going to surrender their contract in uh, that there is a statement uh, pending which is going to be released very, very shortly. Uh, so that's obviously concerning as a, as a Brookborough resident. Um, that's concerning for the local area as well because obviously the, I know the Brookborough Clinic was uh, severely under pressure as well recently. So. Uh, I just want to put that out there and see if there's any response from the trust. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Councillor Deehan. Yes, well, very briefly, Chair, uh, thank you and thanks to the trust for offering to respond in writing to these queries. I just really wanted an update, uh, if possible, Chair, on whether or not the Western Trust is intending to extend uh, its uh, provision of um, general medical services for Dromore and Trillick uh, uh, beyond uh, the 31st of March. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, so, uh, Alison, is that uh, those questions, uh, Oliver, you have them? Yeah, yeah, Chair, just yeah. maybe to clarify, we, we sorry, Oliver, but, but just to say we, we, we have responses to eight of the nine queries that have been submitted, which we can circulate. Um, Councillor Swift had a late query in, and I understand we'll receive response to that in writing. I appreciate there were a couple of supplementaries there, which uh, will be submitted now, I take it via Oliver. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Thanks, Alison. Okay. So uh, thank you for your attendance um, today and uh, appreciate it. So um, we'll move back to the agenda, Alison, I presume. Yes, Chair, so you're just back really to uh, matters arising uh, yeah. from the minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of October. Yeah, so um, so we have, uh, these have been, uh, they have been approved. So we just go through a page one, page two, page three, page four, Page five. Chair, if if I may just, uh, it's at the bottom of page five and into page six, uh, just to advise that we've received, the council has received correspondence from a member of the public uh, regarding representations made by the chief executive of the trust at the October meeting uh, and expressing the view that that is not uh, her understanding of the situation. So we have uh, advised the individual and also the trust of those concerns and we've also advised how the the individual uh, can make a complaint to the trust in that regard okay um thank you alison um page six page seven page eight page nine page ten and page eleven so, um, 
Chair, if I might just note generally, I know we had um, itemised on the agenda the update on the capital investment proposals for Carrickmore Health Centre. So just to note, we've received nothing further and uh, we did receive some information to the best of my recollection from the trust previously regarding the neurology service staffing. But if there's any gaps in that, we can certainly go back. Yeah, uh, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, th thanks for letting me in there, Chair. I just confirm maybe through Oliver there that we've received the organisational chart that that I was uh, mentioned there in the minutes. Uh, just if we can confirm that that has been received. Um, I can follow that up, Councillor Thompson. Um, my understanding was that it had been sent, but I'll check just via Chris whether that's went out to yourselves or not. Um, so my apologies if it hasn't, but I'll certainly check it out for you. Um, that's okay. okay. Thank you, Oliver. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, so, um, items we have item five done. Item six response for Western Trust. So the um, we have eight eight out of them nine questions. Alison responses. So yes, Chair. So we will issue those now to to members after the meeting. Okay. Uh, as in this afternoon, you know we'll do That's that. Grand. And uh, item seven is done. Uh, and item eight is correspondence. We we've no correspondence, chair. Okay. Um. I had a I had a de or de councillor. Well, she just left there, but from councillor Armstrong. Um. I don't know. Should I do it in her absence, Alison, or um? Well, if, if certainly, chair, if you've the information that you if you've enough and you wish to do so. Your your discretion. Go to this other screen, hold on. Um, uh, yeah, um, she wanted to raise a request under AOB uh, for the meeting today's meeting about Fermanagh Parkinson support group is looking to set up a meeting with Fiona McKenna, Parkinson's nurse, covering Fermanagh and Throne, and also with uh, uh, Bernard McGrath from the Trust and with uh, Dr. James Conway, consultant at the SWA, uh, no, uh, regarding the direction of Parkinson's in Fermanagh. So I presume it covers uh, the programs and uh, what way support network or whatever is in. So uh, can we get that um, actioned uh, and correspondence, you know, to set up that meeting if possible? Yes, Chair, maybe just for the record, if, if you're proposing, we'd take a seconder. Uh, just well, I'll, to I'll propose on her on her behalf and uh, Councillor Stevenson will second. And uh, so, thank you. Uh, is any any other members any other urgent and relevant business? I um. I have uh, I have a question around um. What did I say what um. There's. It, um, yeah. Uh, Rheumatology, uh, rheumatologist, or H E U M A T O L O G I S T, uh, used to come to the SWA, um, but the service seems to be that it's going to be uh, based in OMA, and that uh, I think it's going to affect maybe four to five hundred patients um, from the Fermanagh area. So uh, I think from the time before that it was that uh, uh, an outreach program or an outreach day was put on in SWA for the, you know, for to capture all these patients once a week or twice a week for to get uh, everybody seen. But it seems that people will have to travel um, to OMA for to, uh, to, you know, the OMA people and Fermanagh people will have all to go to the one area. And uh, I was asking if that can be 
re-looked at and uh, get it reinstated back to SWA for one or two days. We are in a climate crisis and uh, the less traveling that we have to do, um, it would be better. So if I can ask that and make that a proposal, I was wondering if I could get a seconder for that. Uh, Councillor Warrington, thank you very much. So um, then item number 10 is uh, we have to go into confidential business. Can I have a proposer and seconder to go in? Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Dehan, thank you very much. So um, we are off. Um, we just wait to confirmation, Chair, that the recording or the 